good soup. All right, I'll bring this in. Mm -hmm. Game of Thrones Season 6 Revisited, Episodes 1, 2, and 3. Welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron, the Nerd Soup Monkey. And you read the title right, and you just heard me correctly. We are going back and revisiting Game of Thrones Season 6. Uh, we had the chance to review it at the time, but those were way back in the old days of Nerd Soup. I was drunk for every single one of them. Different time. You know what it was? I would have <laughs> That is true. I would have softball, and then I'd be drinking, then I'd... Watch the episode while drinking, and I have to come here after. My Uber bills were through the roof, but it was worth it. Actually, no, it wasn't, because we didn't make any money off of them. <laughs> oh, how times have changed, for better and for worse. But yeah, season six, I think uh, most fans enjoyed it at the time. Coming off of season five, there was uh, some disappointment there. But season six, the show kind of found its mojo again. Uh, there were a lot of things to tie up. Obviously, Jon Snow's death, the disappearance of Daenerys after being kidnapped by the Dothraki, Cersei in King's Landing having to deal with the Sparrows, a problem that she kind of dug up herself. So they were working with a lot of good uh, threads here. But going back into season six, watching these first three episodes, uh, what did you think? Is there anything new that you liked about it, didn't like? Uh, how do you view it as a setup for the rest of the season? I actually quite enjoyed it because I, I always like felt or I guess when people talked about season six, it was always like the beginning wasn't as strong as its ending. And I think that can be the case, but more so towards some of these middle episodes coming up. I think these first three episodes are actually really solid, and um, this was like the first time watching something that... Uh, season five obviously diverged from the books quite a bit, but um, season six is like the start of really kind of going on their own path. And as a viewer going into it, that kind of intrigued me because I was going to get much more things that I had no idea about. Whereas some things happened differently, but were kind of in the same same sphere as what was going on in the books. This was right after Dance of Dragons, especially when you look at uh, Daenerys's storyline and John's. And that was the big cliffhanger on season five, John getting diced up a little bit. But I, I do, I think I had this sentiment at the time. I, I do like how they just got right back into it, where it's like the speculation going into the season, I recall, was just, is John coming back? What's John? Everyone asking Kit Harrington, what is he doing? What's going on? For them to kind of wrap that up by episode two, instead of dragging it out, I think works very well. By the way, great with HBO Max. I don't know if you noticed this. They skip you to the next episode way too early. I was watching when John gets alive and it said next episode and I had to say no before it got the circle filled up and it would have skipped him being alive. Imagine watching that for the first time and just missing it because HBO Max cut it off. Yeah, their app has some problems. Mm. They have to take care of that. I definitely think they did a good job playing off all the tension of Jon Snow's assassination. You know, the fight between Ed, the remaining Night's Watch that didn't kill Jon, Davos, the Red Woman, you know, having the wildlings storm in. Mm -hmm. That summer, I mean, people speculating on, is he going to come back? Is he not? That was just one of the, it's like a who shot Dallas or no, who shot JFK? It's like in Dallas when it ends on that cliffhanger. And then seeing what he does in 6, 7, and 8, you kind of forget that he ever did die. Right, and that's the thing too, because like I said before, the book's uh, Dance of Dragons ends with, well, John's story ends with him getting stabbed. So there was no clear resolution to what happens with John. And I think everyone always talks about, especially up until like season four, that book readers did a good job of not spoiling it. But also the show, I don't think, reached its height as high as it was at during this time. So I feel like if John was coming back in the books, people would have known right away. But it was that we had no idea. Book readers couldn't uh, spoil that information for anybody because nobody knew even though we all speculated heavily that he would come back but so that mystery going in i think was uh pretty cool and for them not to drag it out and have him back by episode two i thought was done really well you start to see some of the cracks here in season six they're more evident mm -hmm. in season five but season six had so much spectacle i think it was easier for us to ignore them but one of my gripes would be the way they approach magic. We've talked about this before, that D&D &D were a bit more hesitant to include some of these fantastical elements that George would uh, put into his stories that were sometimes head-scratching in a good way and maybe in a not-so-good way. But I think one of the best theories about John's resurrection was that he has this warging ability, so he put himself inside of Ghost, and that's how the Red Woman's going to bring him back. She's mm -hmm. going to patch up his body, and he's going to warg back into the body. But for the show's version of that, I, I wish there was a bit more wow factor. 
it is kind of just Melisandre saying words in a fictional language and scrubbing him and cutting some hair and he's back alive. And I think in the time oh, she that cleaned was, him up. It's like my boy needs to come back fresh. She did give him the fresh. <laughs> <laughs> if you're gonna beat the Night King, you gotta look good doing yeah. it. Can't look like a slob. But he comes back and obviously at the time it was a huge moment. You know, that became a big I, gif. I got chills watching it again. The way they follow it up in episode three, I wish there was more of a snap back into reality for Jon Snow. He kind of has to gather himself like he's confused. I wish it was a moment where he's being killed and then he's alive and it's instant. Like, wh- how the fuck did I get here? I was just yeah. fucking stabbed. You know, the fact that he has to process it, I felt like that could have been done better. Um, well, I think Davos too going to Melisandre like, hey, red lady, bring back John. Like, yeah. Give it the old college try. He, he references the things that he's seen her do. And obviously she's got some sort of ability, but that is sort of a stretch. Like, hey, you know magic. Can you resurrect someone? <laughs> she's like, well, I've seen it done before. And when you go back to that moment when Thoros brings back Beric, that's a wow moment. Everyone is just stunned, shocked. And I think season six, seven, and eight does miss that a little bit, where it's it's the characters' reactions to these events should have been stronger. Because magic was something that was, you know, always in the shadows nobody actually believes it so when those magical moments do happen i wanted some of those you know reactions and even when melisandre kind of this is like why we do the revisit it's because you can look forward at what happens um when she gets on a knee and talks about like i thought stannis was the prince i was promised and it was you like that really pisses me off (laughs) yeah and it's like i know john like obviously the role he played in later seasons was they don't want to beat a Night King without John, but like in that moment, you're thinking flaming sword. He's going to go at him one on one. Prince that was promised back in this bitch. Right. And the way they've handled prophecy, it was it's not like Harry Potter where John's got this plot armor and he can just defeat everyone because he's the main character. He's gone through a lot of shit. He's de- so, he died. So I think he's earned that by this point of the story to mm-hmm. become the chosen one, to be a bit more optimistic. Um, maybe he doesn't have to have such a happy ending like he actually got, but that's way far down the line. Mm. But I did enjoy the moment between Davos and John telling him to go back out there and just die again. Keep cleaning up the shit uh, until someone else stabs you in the back. I love Davos <laughs> so much. Great pep talk. I, I, man, Liam Cunningham is this character. Was He's one of the best good guys on the show. He's very His comforting presence. Yeah, even when he's like, when Alistair's knocking on the door, he's like, I'll need a horse and some mutton. I'd like some mutton. What? Well, I'm not much of a hunter. Not that much of a hunter. Speaking of Alistair, like, I... I know he's like a huge prick and everything, but I always respected his character. Even yeah, me in these too. episodes too. He's very like, you know, you don't want him to kill John, but um I look at him more favorably by far than I would an Ollie. Yeah, Ollie sucks. I mean, his face sucks yeah. too. Dude, I hate his fucking face. <laughs> and when they're arguing with him and like uh when they're uh when he's at the high table with telling them that he killed John and Ollie takes that step next to him and like I was flexes there too. up next to him. Yeah. Like, fuck you, kid. Um, <laughs> that was also a good moment from Kit Harrington when he realizes, yeah, Ollie was one of the ones who stabbed me. After all I did for that little fucker. He was going to be my nepotism, baby. And then he went with Alistair. I always appreciated the dynamic between Jon Snow and Alistair. You know, when Jon Snow is voted in Lord Commander and he makes Alistair First Ranger. Sign of respect, kind of a team of rivals there, understanding his uh, his experience with the Watch and that he is probably his most valuable soldier. But that was, you know, one of Jon Snow's uh, weaknesses as a character is that he was a little bit too trusting. And I always, I said this at the time, I wish we would have got a private conversation between Jon and Alistair before he was hung. I, I just always appreciate those scenes. You know, when people are, they have their differences and they try and chalk it up but you know that it's not going to happen it's sort of like um when john is trying to convince man's raider to bend the knee you know a scene like that where i I know i have to kill you but at least let's try and come to some sort of understanding well yeah even alistair when he talks about it uh to the other members of the night's watch and he's like i have no doubt john thought he was doing the right thing like he's always been hard on john but i think he he respects the position and he respects some brothers in the night watch they just don't see eye to eye and I did like the line he said to John before he killed him, uh, before he died. He was like, uh, you'll be fighting these battles for the rest of your life, and but I'm going to rest now. Something like that. Like That was a very strong line from him. And a good way I, you to know go what? Out. It ended up, yeah, coming true. Because mm-hmm. he does end the series going north with the Wildlings, and he's basically their leader. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a burden. But uh, like, like I said, I think John did get sort of a, a happy ending there. 
And this was a controversial decision for a lot of people, leaving Bran out of season five and then bringing him back for season six. And we get into these moments with the Three-Eyed Raven where he's learning more about his green seeing abilities, being able to go back in time, go into the future. Um, These scenes are actually really great. And these are very important moments because it's the first time, well, the second time the show has done flashbacks and very key characters, Ned Stark and Lyanna and Benjen. We'll throw in Benjen there. I still think these scenes are really good. And you have the casting change with Max von Sydow as the Three-Eyed Raven. Yeah, I think, looking back, that's one of the worst decisions of, like, history. Taking him out of season five? Yeah. Of history? (laughs) Right up there with Oppenheimer. Yeah, knowing that he's going to be king and taking him out of a whole season is just ridiculous. And especially with a younger actor, because I think with Bran as a whole, and it happens with a lot of child actors when they kind of grow out of their role, And obviously, there's nothing really to combat that because of time. You know, time's undefeated. But he's not the same brand that we were were used to uh, the first two or three seasons. I think that brand is much more likable. I think somehow he's a better actor when he was younger. Or just the character he was playing was easier to play, that he comes off as a rootable character. Here, I don't think he's fully there yet. And I think he's much better than he is portrayed when he's, you know, dead inside. But, like, not being with that character for a whole season and kind of bridging that gap, knowing that he's going to be king, I think made that decision to make him king or the reaction to him being king that much more, like, off-putting. And especially now, looking back at who he is in the end, when he's this kind of omnipresent, emotionless weirdo, and then watching Max von Sydow, who's a... I mean... It's not news to say he's a better actor than Isaac Hens said, right? But, like, he's not... They're not playing the same role. His three-eyed raven, there's a bit, a bit of a more swagger to him or a bit of a more uh, personality there. So I don't get the choice to make him this emotionless w- character that we see him in when the uh, standing three-eyed raven now is not that at all. Yeah, that is weird going back and looking at this because he's a bit funny. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he totally acknowledges Bran's feelings for his family, and he understands that if he keeps him here too long, he may lose himself to all of this. This is the first time he's felt this sort of, um, that the warmth of being around family, of being home, being protected. And he knows that Bran has to go on to not only fight in this war, but like you said, become king. So that, that's, that's a weird choice, and that falls back on D&D, where I don't want to say these characters become caricatures, but they become very stiff as the seasons progress. Like where seen- Tyrion has to make dick jokes all the time, Bran's going to be emotionless, Jon's an idiot, and Daenerys is pissed. That's kind of where all these characters go, but that was a strange choice. And I think in these... He's alive. Like, <laughs> yeah, like he's Blood alive. He's like, uh, not Blood Raven. Well, um, well, that's another choice that will always piss me off, the line about him being there for thousands of years. You could still tell this story by keeping him a Targaryen, by keeping him Brendan Rivers. Uh, To me, that makes no sense. And especially because Max von Sydow would have been the perfect actor to portray a younger version of this character. But that's a nitpick. Yeah. Um, But... Yeah, like like, like I said, like he's such such a renowned actor and probably you have more faith in him um, maybe playing more of a stern role, whereas maybe that won't fit for Bran, but like, man, like he had like there's a liveliness to him. Like he, he's like, yeah, he's been there for a thousand and he portrays that very well, but he's not disconnected from all types of social interaction. Yeah, like when Bran's watching his father fight Arthur Dane and Bran realizes Arthur Dane's the better fighter and the three-eyed raven goes, far better. <laughs> yeah. It's a little cocky there. Bran has that dry tone. humor too later on, but he just doesn't, it's just not delivered. No, with this, and obviously, yeah, you're comparing a young actor to a seasoned veteran, but still, th- I think that comes back to directing, where you can watch those moments and realize, okay, he's not really nailing it the way that the three-eyed, the previous Three-Eyed Raven was, let's shoot that again. You know, let's maybe change your cadence here, change your tone, but those decisions were never made, they just kind of rolled with it, where he's just that same sort of stoic, emotionless person for seven and eight. And this is the start where I feel like Bran is not considered a main character anymore, when he very much early on, he was, I think, the most intriguing character. If you want to say Tyrion, who had the better story than Bran and Stark, first two seasons... Bran Stark had a hell of a good story. I think he had the most intrigue with his connection with the wolf, the dreams, the three-eyed raven. That's where a lot of this fantasy started to set in for everybody other than Daenerys and the White Walkers. Um, 
So yeah, early brand was fantastic. And then you had to take a year gap and you're like, oh, I forgot about brand. Who's going to be king one day? These flashbacks were so huge at the time. The first time we're seeing all these stories actually play out where Ned does fight against Arthur Dane. And I don't think the inclusion of Arthur Dane disappointed. People found the two swords to be a little ridiculous, but I don't care. I think it's awesome to see him fighting off those five soldiers. And I think for Bran, you know, it's a big moment for him to realize, uh, I've heard these stories all my life about Robert and Ned taking down the Mad King. They were always portrayed as heroes, but you see this dishonorable way in which he defeated Arthur Dane. So it, it's not all, I'm the good guy, you know, I persevered against the bad guys. There were some, there's always some gray, and obviously that's uh, with a lot of Game of Thrones. It's the classic telling a friend about your high school achievements, and as the years go on, they get bigger and bigger. Like, right. Oh, yeah, Arthur Dane, <laughs> come on. Dude overrated. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something that goes back to the books that young Ned, or just Ned in general, was never a great swordsman. So he's, he's really struggling there, man. He's huffing and puffing. It's that one meme of Drake trying to play defense. And I, it speaks to the character of Rhaegar. You know, he was always portrayed as the man who kidnapped Lyanna. But in this moment, he leaves behind two of his best fighters to protect Lyanna. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking, oh, well, the characters in the show, are, well, that doesn't really add up here. Rhaegar was always portrayed as the villain. The Targaryens are crazy. You think that they're setting up Bran to do something really cool with his magic down the line, right? Because he has the moment where he calls out for Ned, and Ned looks back and says, whoa, yeah. what can he change here? And obviously we get some, some of that in episode 5 with Hodor. Yeah. That ends up kind of just being it, right? I think in, in terms of using his magical powers, he game plans a bit in season 8, and he tells John, he tells Sam, he confirms the history for Sam in season 7, can't make the man warg a dragon? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Not even that too. It's like establish more, and I know they have that moment with the uh, with the hold the door scene where the Night King is coming for him. But I don't know, like build up that rivalry, UFC that shit, sell the fight. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the best moments is when Bran is scouting the army and the Night King grabs him. Yeah. It's kind of their first. Well, that is their first interaction. You could have built a little sub rivalry there where the Night King and Jon Snow are the two. You know, that's the big one, but he's also got to deal with little brother. He's yeah. not so bad himself. I think he just feels so disconnected, and I don't know if that's because you separate him from the rest of the story, but we've seen characters completely separated also that still fit. But, yeah, I think the season off really, really damaged his character, and that's a shame because, again, yeah, the, he's the king. The arc in season six is good for me because these no, moments are so important it works i'm just thinking like but it's it's also not because of him yeah it's just because he is the the window into the history that has been teased for so long so he kind of just benefits from from being there and there's not really a lot of potential to act your ass off in those moments you know you're kind of just reacting to shit but that's why i think it's going to be so much better in the books when brand's king and more digestible because yeah because we spent more ways, time with him yeah, a lot of ways, A Song of Ice and Fire, as much as it is a shared story, it's very much a brand story in a lot of ways. And, I mean, yeah, he did take him out of a whole book, but he, did, he took a lot of people out of a lot of books. It just fits, especially when you get that inside and the inner monologue. Like, Bran just feels like more of a main character and more significant. Yeah, well, we might as well go to another main character who can be argued as the main character, and that's Daenerys. Uh, I remember I enjoying... Like the map in the beginning. Going. Yeah, look at yeah. that. I remember enjoying Daenerys in season six. I think a lot of the season suffers from spreading the drama a bit thin, where they know they have to have a big moment for Daenerys and then a big moment for Cersei and Jon's big moment. So you think, okay, some of these things could have been resolved a little bit more quickly, get Daenerys back to Marine where she belongs. But man, Amelia Clark, when she's sharing the scene with the cow, she really is, you, you are convinced that she could beat this man up just because of the way she carries herself. And it helps having those big-ass dragons in the sky backing you up. Yeah. But she is as intimidating as any of the fighters in this show, the big, muscly men. She's just got that intimidating aura about her. Yeah. Where you want to bend the knee and let oh, her do yeah, what she wants. I would have done it right away. <laughs> no, I mean, where you want to... She would have just started her title and, like, stop right there. <laughs> I'm sold. And the titles became such a meme, but, man, I love it when she brings out those fucking titles. I love when people, when it falls on deaf ears... <laughs> like, I don't give a fuck. He said a millionth of your name? Yeah. <laughs> 
as soon as uh, the well, the Dothraki, that's they're just extremists when it comes to everything. So yeah, they'll murder you, they'll rape you, they'll torture, they'll do all that stuff. But when it comes to their religion, they follow that shit. Mm. So finding out that she was married to Cal Drogo, yeah, she gets a one-way ticket to uh, Vase Dothrak, forced retirement in the middle of her prime. It's a shame. David Stern would, actually. <laughs> But uh, so some of the dialogue here, yeah, no, it's literally Jordan. <laughs> yeah, she was sent away. Go play minor league baseball, Danny. But the dialogue here, some of it's really goofy with the Dothraki. I think some of their remarks, like when they're talking about like what's the best things in the world, <laughs> I find it a little, I find it entertaining. It's so modern. Yeah. I think a lot is, of yeah. the way that we speak now seeps in on these later seasons, mm-hmm. where if you go back and watch season one, two, and three, it's so Shakespearean. Especially when it comes to Tyrion. You know, Tyrion was so poetic even when he was dissing people. But now it's just, oh, Varys, you don't have a dick, so you're not a boy. Yeah. <laughs> no, him saying, like, one of the mo- it's one of the five best things in the world. It's kind of like a modern joke. But it's like, like something you hear on Family Guy. I did, like, I got a chuckle out of them, like, saying, like, oh, it's like one of the best things in the world. It's like, oh, what about killing a cow? They're like, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> I found that pretty entertaining. But yeah, I think this could have been. I mean, obviously, the point of this storyline is to get the Dothraki on her side. I find it to be not a waste of time, but it could have been cleaner. Drogon could have, like, Drogon could have showed up when they surrounded the horde and they could have been like, fuck. Right, And yeah. at that moment decided, but you need time to kind of let everything play out Marine for her to come back with this army and be the hero again. So it makes sense in that regard. I just wish it wasn't as, you know, like in an action movie when something keeps going wrong to the plan, but you know, they're going to, it's not going to matter because the plan's going to get resolved anyway. Yeah. And they're just buying time. It's what it feels like to me. What do you think about Tyrion and Marine? these first three episodes? I know this is something that fans didn't like at the time. This is kind of, I don't want to call it the beginning of the end for Tyrion, because I think he does have a strong season eight, which is kind of funny. But the politics here aren't that interesting. You kind of know how it's going to be resolved. Mm -hmm. That Daenerys is going to come back and she's going to blow some shit up with the dragons, which is a great moment. Uh, But even when Tyrion finds all the ships burning and he's like, looks like we're not sailing to Westeros anytime soon. Fuck! (laughs) Just go to Westeros already. Yeah. um, I think certain aspects I did like. I I liked Varys kind of transferring, like they say, can Varys game is a translate overseas. I think we could see that. He's kind of pulling strings in Marine, and especially that conversation he has with the the woman who was working with the Harpies, kind of giving her the, playing out the scenario for her, in his favor. Um, obviously, everything doesn't go super smoothly in Marine, but I did like Varys. I, I don't think Tyrion interacts well with Grey Worm and Missandei. I just don't think that's a fun dynamic to watch, and they kind of try to play it off as they try to play up their character traits, so like to make it like an odd thruple, but it just doesn't <laughs> feel natural. It's like, oh, well, Tyrion's smart and witty. Grey Worm's very stern and serious. Masande is kind of, uh, she has like this innocence and different type of worldview. Let's play those up a little. That will be fun. Yeah, you wonder if they would have kept Barrison alive and Barrison's more in the Tyrion role. A bar- yeah, Barrison. And then Tyrion shows up and says, "This is how we're going to do this. You're struggling." I think if Barris Var of Varys, Varys, Barristan, Tyrion, in that, like, trying to figure this out would have added a different layer to it. Yeah, I think that's a more fun dynamic because you have these, you have this one character who's got such a strong moral center and these other two characters who are a bit more flexible. That's almost kind of the perfect way to rule a city, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what we get in the books where Daenerys does get taken away and Barrison's left in charge of Marine, and he struggles because he's a follower. In the sense of he's very loyal and he's going to carry out commands and he wants to follow people that he actually believes in. That's why he makes the trek over to Essos. Leading a city, governing, is uh, an entirely different thing. So that could have made for a more fun dynamic. I think the scene with Tyrion and the dragons, we all looked at that as proof that eventually he was going to get on the back of one of those babies and burn some shit down. But I think it's, it's a great scene. You know, the CGI, we commented on the last trailer for House of the Dragon that it's really improved. But the dragons here look really good. And it's always easier with CGI when the lighting is a bit dim. You can't really make it out fully. But to me, that that made my skin crawl a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, being in that room, (laughs) Tyrion, he's he's literally playing with fire there. And the story he gives, uh, I thought that it was sweet. That's something that they didn't touch on a lot in the show. But in the books, they always talk about Tyrion's love 
for dragons you know seeing drogon for the first time that was a great moment for him so that's a scene that holds up and uh going back to westeros we catch up with sansa and theon after they escape from ramsay in season five they jump off the tower into the snow i got such a kick out of first of all great scene with brienne saving the day thought the choreography was awesome podrick fighting there's such rage in her and then when she gets down on the knee it's like she's she's so tired of asking sansa to be in her service you know it's like, just like once again <laughs> i'm good you know what we'll get back to this come on theon i'll have my people email your people yeah, yeah. you know i got theon here okay <sighs> we're still despised by the way <laughs> i got a chuckle out of that because she seems so over it like please just let me give my life for you holy shit simp yes <laughs> But you know what, Ramsey? I don't know, man. With Ramsey rewatching it, he comes off a bit more goofier now. I thought he was always a bit goofy. That's just kind of like his, yeah. per- his personality, and I think. But almost more mustache twirly, <laughs> you know. I prefer being an only child. <laughs> That's brutal, man. It didn't hit for me the the same the second way around. I remember in in the moment, I was like, "Oh my god, this guy's terrible." But Roose Bolton's such a big character, and you kind of just kill him off in one scene, and he's gone. Very quick pregnancy there. When uh, he's mourning over Miranda, he's like, feed her body to the dogs. Really? That's a little much. Like, uh, That's excessive. Well, but there's no way that these motherfuckers wouldn't kill this guy. You know, nobody's running around giving commands like this and not getting a knife in the back. I think, I don't know, I think they did a good job of, like, kind of displaying the reasons why they would support Ramsay, especially the other lords, the Karstarks, the Umbers, where... I did appreciate the Umbers humbling him. That was actually one of my favorite scenes of these first three episodes. So yeah, humble that little fucker. Yeah, but fuck the Umbers also. Kill yeah, the Shaggy well, well, Dog. Whatever. We don't know if that Shaggy kept Dog... Rick on with the unicorns and... <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, but like, it's almost hard not to... When you're that evil and sadistic to come off a little wacky at times because... But he's wacky when we first meet him with Theon. Yeah. But it's, it's in a way where... I don't want to be in the same room with this guy. Where in season oh, six... Oh, you want to have tea with season six Ramsey? If I was in a room with him, I would try and fight him. I'm not intimidated by him. I, I admit that he's a psycho and that there's something wrong with him, but I want to punch him. In season four, I was terrified of him. You I know, beat when the he... shit out of Ted Bundy. I don't want to break bread of the man. Just going back to the whole who's better, Ramsey or Joffrey, I think it's Joffrey by a mile. Yeah, Joffrey had that shit eating about him. You wanted to fight him. You know you could beat the shit out of him. But, but you he, were also scared because of his power. You yeah. know, you never know what he what he's going to tell someone to do to you. You know, it was feel, all that in one. I feel bad for the maester. Yeah, I mean, the maester's got to grow a fucking pear, man. I mean, he's, if he's, somebody uh, told me to feed your dead girlfriend's corpse to a bunch of dogs, I'm scheming something up. We got to get you out of here, bro. <laughs> That's too much. <sighs> I think he just has his law. Lo- like he's untouchable at this point. Yeah, he yeah. really can't. So I don't know. I think he's still. Excuse me out. Even when, like... Well, I don't... I think in the books, he's going to f- meet his end. I mean, well, he does the meet thing. his they end. They made him hot in the show. They did make him hot, right. Can't do that. <laughs> he's like a little silly Ramsey to me in season six. Yeah. Book Ramsey's disgusting. Yeah, no, he's a disgusting man. But we do see the return of Rick on. That's another character that they got rid of him for two seasons. Well, they always get rid of him. Yeah. They do in the books also. That's, yeah, that's keeping in line with the books. And Asha, look at that. Yeah, great idea. Oh, we'll bring you to the Umbers. They'll teach you. They'll teach you stuff. <laughs> you know what characters still suck? Sam and Gilly. I skipped that scene. You did? <laughs> I, sh- I skipped it. I swear to God. I used to think C was called C because you can, as far as you can see, I, I would have dropped like, her off somewhere. So- <laughs> <laughs> it's like you fall madly in love, risk it all to be with her, and then you realize, like, I hate her. <laughs> Just one boat ride to Old Town or to Horn Hill. <laughs> Yeah. Really? Yeah, this is not working. I think, uh, I don't that know. That was just passion. Infatuation, it's dead now. Yeah. No, they're all right. They're fine. I think what the disappointment for me with Sam is you think he's going to go to Old Town and do something, once again, cool with the magic. The glass candles are lit. You know, people are teleporting. They're transporting. They're doing all types of weird shit. And he doesn't get there until season seven. And all he does is steal some books. So that's another, like, damn, get this man in Old Town in the beginning of season six. You can't think of anything cool for him to do instead of just being berated by Randall Tarley at dinner. I mean, he stops at Bravos in the books. Yes, he does. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Rip Maester Eamon. But, yeah, 
I have nothing on Sam and Gilly. <laughs> well, let's talk about your favorite, Cersei Lannister. Uh, arguably her strongest season in all these moments. I just love this woman. I love hearing her talk. You know, the first scene when she's mourning Marcella and you hear her talk about Marcella was good. How the hell did that happen? I think King's Landing is my favorite part on this rewatch just because I think that's the most important, important to this season. Maybe not for the scope of the show, but like... And like you said, it is Cersei's best season. So, and just Jonathan Price is the High Sparrow. Talk about like just a screen presence. I think that he is such a great character, but he's also the most infuriating character to watch. Just the way he tries to manipulate people and his arrogance. He talks about a lot, like uh, you know, just humanity and just how it's and like he's. He, he tries to convey that he's on the same level and we all have faults, but he is so goddamn arrogant and kind of just contradicts a lot what he says just by a lot of his facial movements and his actions. No, and, he's, yeah, he's a pure sociopath. And just seeing him again interact, that interaction with Jamie I think was awesome. Interaction with Tommen was great. Um, he is really the perfect character to make Cersei be a protagonist in this storyline. <laughs> yeah, I think by this point, a lot of people still didn't like Cersei, but everyone hated the Sparrows. Mm -hmm. Everyone wanted to see them die. So some of those moments where Tommen has the chance to take them out with violence and he doesn't, that's why people became so frustrated with him. And, and like I said, he's a kid being pulled in so many different directions. He was really set up to fail by his mother. Yo, he has this missing Joffrey. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing Septo and Ella after watching Ted Lasso is always going to make me laugh now because knowing that it's uh, Hannah Waddingham who is just like the sexiest woman ever. She's a really solid actress because she's so bubbly mm -hmm. and fun-loving in Ted Lasso. You know, you're such a warm character and here she's just as hated as uh, I think the High Sparrow was at this point after what she did to Cersei and now still torturing a fan favorite, Marjorie Tyrell. Yeah. Another character who I thought, man, when she converted and she was playing the game along with the High Sparrows, I thought she was cooking something up. No, King's Landing is very strong this season. Yeah, but then she just gets blown up. Yeah, because she fucked around and found out. She did fuck around and find out, but man, I wish she would have had a better ending. But you know, we get that first look at her. We also are introduced to Zombie Mountain. I think episode two was probably the strongest out of these first three episodes. When he kills that random guy, yeah. that shit was brutal. There were some big time brutal kills. 1-1, uh, one, one, when they stormed Castle Black and he slams yep. that guy against yep. the wall. <laughs> Episode 2 got real bloody. Yeah, Arthur Dane was cutting up. Yeah. No, but you see uh, the reaction from Olena, from Kevin Lannister. They want nothing to do with Cersei and Jaime because, yeah, Cersei put them all in this position. <laughs> so why the fuck would they listen to her, right? But well, her, her arrogance, too, strolling up to the to the meeting. Oh, she's got, take my seat. Yeah, she's got... Queen Mother. Big dog behind her. She does got big doggy behind her. <laughs> yeah, and Elena Tyrell is great. She only had a couple lines in these first three episodes, but they stung. Always with the stingers. Oh, she gets her bad at the end of this season. Elena was always so mean to Cersei. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I think the moments Jamie and Cersei have together, too, are very strong as well. Um, I think what it does, I think it's just a part, like, a, it's a great setup for what's later to come. I mean, you, you got, obviously, with... Uh, Marcella dying, kind of slowly, eating, like emptying out Cersei till basically she's has nothing left to lose, and I think it it really is done well. Dorn moments too. I guess that's all connected with King's Landing at this point. Oh right, yeah. They run up on the leader of Dorn, kill him, and nobody does anything about it. And it's like, oh, I guess that's fine. Well, they all have. I mean, Ariel Hota. I mean, that's the only one you got to take out. Everybody else was. Man commands an army. He, he doesn't have any relationships with some of his commanding officers. That's they they tried to convey that point that he doesn't leave his palace and whatever. But like, what pisses me off is like, obviously Dorne was done super dirty. <sighs> like Dorne Mar Martell, like he has a plan. This is all like in the books. He comes off as the way they portray him here, but like in his back pocket, he's he's got things cooking up. The Dornish master plan. What is he cooking? And here they just you know get rid of him. <laughs> well, they got rid of a lot of those plans mm -hmm. for these characters. I don't know if that was ever in the back of their heads trying to set it up, but I think just the reaction to the Sand Snakes and everything in Dorne, just how disjointed it all was, they were just like, all right, let's just get rid of him and we'll, we'll see them later. Yeah, the choice to make was get rid of the Sand Snakes and just give us Ariane Martell. We don't need Oberyn to have a million daughters. We don't need to focus on all of them. If it needs to be a smaller story... But with Ariane, you kind of need Aegon in a way. I'm not opposed to that. Yeah, you bring in Aegon. 
This is going back to season five, no, obviously. Quentin. That could have been fun, too. <laughs> that could have made uh, Maureen a bit more interesting. You know, this little Martell boy running around begging Daenerys to marry him, then he just gets fucking toasted. It's always fun. Somebody loses their life to a dragon. Yeah, it could have been. No, there um, are a lot of changes, and I, I think... Um, you are casting a wide net there, though. So I understand them wanting to go a little tighter, but I think they're... You could go tighter in a different yeah. way, but... Yeah, all the coolness of the Martells really does just die with Oberyn. It's the last time that any of the Martells were likable, but also interesting from a narrative uh, perspective. Because they don't do anything else this season. They literally just kill Doran Martell and just chill. And then Varys walks out and they make a deal. And then they get fucking waxed in season seven. In a brutal way. Brutal, brutal deaths. I love that. And you do have that one scene with Cersei and Tommen where you think that they're going to be on the same page. Uh, and, it, it, you know, looking ahead when Tommen dies and Jaime and Cersei have that conversation, and Cersei calls him a traitor, you know, because th- that's truly the moment where she no longer has anything to lose, right? Yeah. There's, there's still Tommen. So a part of it is, you know, if I can get my claws into Tommen, I, I still have power. I can control the king. But there are so many other people trying to get their claws in him. How do I have to fend them off and keep Tom and happy, which she fails at spectacularly, but it does put her in this new position of power at the end of it. So, but you think I remember watching it at the time, thinking eventually they're going to become a bit more united here, and it will be a joint effort into taking out the sparrows. But at the end of the day, she just leaves that motherfucker in the dark. <laughs> it's a sad, sad season for Tom and when you put it into perspective. No, yeah, you got to loses everything. He pitied the character because he is just getting manipulated in every which way. Uh, if it's Cersei, Marjorie, the Sparrows, Kevin. Well, Kevin's probably like... <laughs> Kevin. He's probably like the only like one I would be cool with Tommen hanging around because he's just like, hey, you know, what's up, Tommen? Let's do some King stuff. No ulterior motive. <laughs> Kevin was the only one Tywin liked. Must be a good dude if Tywin likes you. Yeah, he just seems like a very straightforward guy. Like He would just be like, this is the job, this is what we gotta do, and nothing for my own gain. If it, if it was up for Kevin, he would be back in fucking Castle Rock. You know what, though? Tommen is not the worst king in these first three episodes. It's Balon, who always takes that cake. Mm. Yara's trying to tell him, listen, buddy, war's over. We only took land because they all left. Now they came back. And he, he invokes the name of the war, the war of the five kings. Uh, I, I'm the only king left, so that must mean I won, right? <laughs> Hell of a spin zone. Right. He's so delusional. The Iron Islands, like the Ironborn. Man, we were anticipating some good stuff going into this season with them. I just don't know if there's ever been a group that hyped themselves more that absolutely suck. Like, no, they think they're the shit. Like, oh, well, we do all, we do all this. We do the Iron Way and we have our own kingdom. And it's like, you get fucking waxed at every turn. No one likes Yara you. basically says that. You want to rebel now so we can get, so they can run up on our islands again? Mm-hmm. You think you're protected on this island? They always run up on no us. No one wants the islands either. Yeah, like, no, we would they just... let you have them, but you could just keep trying to take more. <laughs> they just go there, slaughter them, and then just dip back to their homes. Well, that's what Euron's presence was supposed to be, right? This outsider who's traveled the world. I guess he's a bit more open-minded. No eye patch. Uh, So he ends up just kind of being an annoying presence in this show. Yeah. And I I don't think he ever got better. I think season seven, when he comes back with the uh, fresh-ass outfit. He's got the fresh fit and he's got the... for that episode, I was like, oh, there we go. The battle sequence Mm -hmm. when he's fucking everybody up. Everybody loved him because he killed the Sand Snakes. Mm Mm-hmm. Even though I'm a big Jessica Henwick fan. Who is Since it? the show has ended, but she's fantastic. Yeah, no, they 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 really did suck, uh, and he kills Balon. But especially like in the the King Smoot, like when you see him, he just looks like a guy. Yeah, it's just uh, Euron is supposed to be this presence. Like you, he's the type of person you're supposed to look at, and without even saying a word, be like you're supposed to be intrigued right away. Like who is this guy? What what what's his deal? Uh, like a Dario type of vibe to him, but a bit more unpredictable. Early Dario first. First, yeah, yeah, I think that guy would have been a great Euron, where he's got this, you, you look and you think, alpha male, ladies man, could rip my guts out, warrior, all those qualities. Or push my guts in. Push my, whichever way you want to do it. Yeah. With this guy, yeah, no, he's just a guy. He's not a bad looking guy. He's a guy. He's a guy, yeah. yeah. I didn't throw your hat in the ring for king and it doesn't make you the favorite. You know, Euron's supposed to show up as the favorite, you know. I, I don't want to say the player we always say, but like, you know. 95 Jordan. There you mm, go. Yeah. Well, they actually lost to the Magic in the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone forgets about that, huh? Um, 96 Jordan. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> just an absolute dog, and he's got, he doesn't have that dog in him. I hate to say it. No. No. He's a fish. He's got a fish. A kraken, really. Like an ironborn. Even when he's like, I am the drowned god. No, you're not, buddy. You may think you are, but you're not convincing anyone. You know, we totally forgot um, the end of episode one when Melisandre takes off the necklace. Oh, yeah. Well, becomes uh, an old woman. Mm. So, I remember being very confused when that happened, sexually. I wonder if... So are those titties fake? Those are fake titties? They're magical. Yeah. Right. So it's an, essentially like she got a boob job. But, like, I still, like, would. No, I mean, I can totally understand why Stannis did all of what he did. <laughs> oh, n- no. Yeah. Don't question Stannis no, yeah. one bit. But that's another thing where... I would kill many a daughters. <laughs> I guess in hot... Hi- wow. I guess in hindsight, that's just what it was. She's this old woman. She's got all this knowledge. So it speaks to her power. It speaks to her ability to conjure up these spells and bring John back to life. I thought that, that they were eventually going to come back to that. But maybe that's something that they establish in the books. Mm-hmm. And they get more deeper into that. You know, what's going on with these Red Priestess? Uh, how much power does she actually have? And for the show, it was, yeah, look at this. This is weird, right? This is makes your skin crawl a bit. Yeah. I remember getting really upset when people made the... I used to get really upset at nitpicks for Game of Thrones. So people, oh, when she didn't have the necklace in the She didn't have the, the necklace yeah. in season three. Well, I, mean, I don't know. Maybe it'll Who gives like, a fuck? <laughs> yeah. Well, she can also she also glamoured a whole human being. So, like, maybe she did it on herself in that moment. Very upset at nitpicks. And uh, episode three ends with Jon Snow saying that his watch has ended. Nice little loophole there. You die, come back to life. You gave your life for the Night's Watch. Yeah, I mean, he still uses their facilities and hangs out there for a little bit, but... <laughs> I'm going to kick my feet up until my tra- travel agent gets back to me, but the castle's yours, Ed. Trust me. It's like, well, your presence here is kind of making it, you know, people are unsure of who's in charge. No, you're in charge, Ed. Trust me, you're in charge. Where's he going? Oh, he's going back to his quarters? <laughs> it's weird. I did enjoy the moment between Ed and John when John walks out for the first time, and, uh... You know, they make the remark about the color of his eyes. But to me, yeah, that moment, John's death, it always felt like such an afterthought in the show. Mm -hmm. And I wish, like I said uh, earlier, there was more wow factor to this man coming back to life. What the fuck is this? I guess they captured it a bit, you know, with everyone's kind of stunned when he does walk out. No, I think that moment was really good. And at the time, I like it as well. I got like a different, especially watching these episodes, like remembering where I was watching it for the first time and kind of reminiscing. I feel like these moments, it was such a show where any any scene could further the story in such a, a unique way. And that's what I think always kept audiences on their toes. So I think watching it like, oh, fucking Game of Thrones tonight, can't wait, it's the intrigue. And every little bit you take, you try to dissect and you try to look forward and like, oh, this happened. So what does it mean for this character? Looking back, there really isn't much of that. So I feel like you can't really critique the show for going back and not having that same intrigue because you got to remember where you were watching it when you were first, like your state of mind when it was first airing. So, and I think it's one of the few shows I was thinking about while I was watching and that really captures an or like the week to week I don't think has ever been stronger than in this season and I think especially because I think the show just took on a pop popularity of its like it, it it transcended anything we've seen on television and I think this was the peak of like the week to week we got to watch Game of Thrones cut break pause go back at Arya we didn't talk about Arya. We kind of did to Arya what they did to Bran in season five. Totally forgot about her story. But I think, you know, going to your point about rewatching it and trying to remember where you were and what you were anticipating at the time, I feel like when you go back for those first four seasons, it feels like, like you're watching a ball of yarn unfold. You know what where the story is heading, but there's still this intricacy to it. There's still that confusion that sets in. Things still catch you by surprise. And I don't want to come off as someone who doesn't like season six now because of what happened in season eight. But you definitely feel like this has lost a bit of its allure because we know that Jon Snow is now alive. And we know that he takes back Winterfell. And we know how it's going to resolve with Cersei and, uh, and the High Sparrow. So, yeah, for me, it's definitely, I don't know if it's necessarily worse now, but I think some of the appeal of it, and like I said, the allure has worn off because of that with season six. And I think these Arya scenes are the perfect example of that. They suck. (laughs) And they fucked this story up going back to season five. But this was just a place to put her. Yeah. You know, we're going to set her up with her own little antagonist here, the waif, who's an asshole and a dick and a bully. And Jack and Nagar's not. He he gets to be good cop. She's bad cop. 
You know Arya's gonna get her eyes back, and she's learning how to fight a bit here. This is another situation with, like, with Bran. Not only is this setup not great, but what does it ultimately amount to? Yeah. And maybe you can put that on George a bit, because her story's not finished. You know, we don't know what she's going to do with these powers in the books. And if she doesn't do anything significant with them, that will also be a disappointment, in my opinion. Especially because the development in Bravos has been better in the books. But the development here is just, we don't have enough budget for any more assassins. It's just you three in this giant castle that's clearly home to dozens of assassins. It's basically assassin Hogwarts, and just no one's there. They're busy. They're on mission. They're, yeah, they're on... Right, of course. And Jack... Man, you think about Jack and Hagar in season three. His presence is just so mysterious. You, you, what, what it, where did he come from? What's his deal? It makes the world feel so alive. And this has the complete opposite effect, where this makes the world feel really small and like this isn't actually happening. You think the other people like on that alley are like, why is this woman beating up a blind though? <laughs> Yeah, what the fuck, man? <laughs> That's Probably. mean. <laughs> hey, is this the blind girl? Well, why why is she hitting him right over with a stick? <laughs> Bravos is supposed to be more advanced. It's the most advanced city in the world. Random chicks beating up blind people. I mean, you could see they that. They look down New- on Westeros. You could see that in New York City. That's true. Yeah. But yeah, I do think the... Uh, oh, that's what they were doing. They were getting it on their phones. <laughs> <laughs> they were making TikToks of yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, I think Bravos is a little bit of a letdown. Even at the time, I don't think we really enjoyed it that much. I think it all concludes rather okay, but I mean, looking forward, I mean, she does kill the Night King. If you want to say what the faceless, how does that translate to later seasons? Um, yeah, the examples with the phrase, but re- really after that, it's not doesn't really have a bigger payoff. But her training as a whole, I think, you know, I think it does have a payoff, even though if people don't like the payoff. She did have a lot of good teachers, huh? Sirio, the Hound, Brienne, Faceless, Brienne, faceless. yeah, damn. Uh, but yeah, I don't think there's really much substance in these scenes from the earlier episodes of season six. I think I still think season six is one of the better seasons. It's largely due to them having two of the, the t- in my opinion, the two best episodes at the tail end. So as a whole, like that, that definitely brings the grade up for the whole season. Um, like I said, I thought these episodes were solid and definitely a different perspective now, especially with a lot of the brand and John and Arya stuff. But I think as episodes themselves and kind of thinking about when we were first watching them, I still think they were solid setup and that's how a lot of the earlier game of thrones episodes played out uh definitely setting up for later seasons although yeah you could definitely point out that these aren't as tight but i think there's still a lot there and like you said looking forward to the door then you have battle of the bastards winds of winter like blood of my blood i think is a great episode as well yeah so there's some fucking bangers in this season yeah um Maybe you can argue that they relied on the big moments a little too much, especially earlier on. And then episode nine and episode 10 are basically elongated great moments. So it's not just a typical episode as we see bouncing back and back and back. They're more contained to one situation. But yeah, I still think this is one of my favorite seasons. I'm I'm definitely looking forward to getting into the rest of them, especially Winds of Winter. It's definitely a season where it, it went Hollywood but it worked way better than season seven and season eight. But like I said, I'm really looking forward to these next two episodes, episodes four and five, two great episodes, and that is going to be part two of our Game of Thrones season six revisited. So if you guys want to watch along, and uh, we will be back. Any last uh, thoughts? No. Had empty. Uh, you no looked thoughts. like you were fucking cooking something up. I was trying. You did like a whole pose. You had your th- finger in the air. You don't understand. I don't speak when I'm not here. I turn it on, I use all my words, and I just sit in silence. Hello, darkness, my old friend. So I was, I was going back into that. I've used all everything I had. I can't even speak in complete sentences right now. <laughs> Man ran out of words. <laughs> all right, guys, see ya. You're like Joe Biden. <laughs> Damn, we were making some good points in that video. Hey guys, Aaron and Nerd Suit Monkey here. Before we end this video, I want to give a quick shout out to our Patreon supporters. What can I say about you guys that I haven't already said about myself? You are the most important part of the channel and the main reason we keep going strong. Like Bo says, you keep the lights on in the fridge, so the fridge is full. Or, or something like that. So, from everyone here at Nerd Soup, I'd like to thank you guys for your continued support. If you're interested in joining the ranks of our patron supporters, head over to patreon.com slash nerdsoup and check out the rewards we offer to our patrons. 
We recently dropped some new stickers for you guys to check out, or you could choose a tier that will allow you to select a movie, show, or video game for us to review. We've got a full slate of fan-suggested reviews coming your way, and we're really excited about the chance to review some of those movies and shows. We've also got t-shirts, mugs, behind-the-scenes videos showing how we bring our videos to life. And once again, thank you to all our Patreon pledgers who have been supporting us throughout the years. Without you, we wouldn't be able to convert all your pledges into cryptocurrency, so thank you from my future self for making us broke. Thank you.